Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Redford, and this is the follow up. Coming up on tonight's show, the impeachment inquiry of President Trump begins its public hearing phase this week, and the battle rages on over who testifies and who doesn't, which could impact the direction and the outcome. Ryan Peterson, a Delta College political science professor, is with us tonight to tell his side of the story. Plus, while Congress and the American public is so focused on the impeachment inquiry, what else is happening globally that we probably need to pay more attention to? And that's not all. While unemployment is low and the economy is seemingly on an upswing, many people right here in mid-Michigan are falling through the cracks, with many ending up in shelters. Dan Streeter from the Rescue Ministries of Mid-Michigan works in the front lines of this important issue. He is with us as well tonight. But first, we'd like to hear from you to help drive the conversation here on the follow-up each and every week or suggest future show topics. You can do that in a variety of ways via social media on Facebook and Twitter. You can also email us or dial into our follow-up hotline. And if you'd like to see any of our past shows this season, just log on to deltabroadcasting.org. Up first, Ryan Peterson from uh, Delta College Political Science. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks well, you know what everyone's talking about. The next step in the impeachment inquiry are the public hearings starting tomorrow, 10 o'clock sharp. There is some talk, though, since the Democrats are leading the process, they're in the majority. They're going to cherry pick every single person that testifies, so you're not going to get a fair and balanced sort of assessment during the testimony. Although, when you look at it in 1990, when the Republicans were in charge, they did the right. same thing, right? Right. So. I mean, I, I think the, the, the short response to that is that there's no good way to do this. There, there is simply, and, and that's, I mean, to some extent, the gist of um, uh, Federalist 66 by Alexander Hamilton, where he talks about what's going to happen in impeachment. And if you read that, and I'd encourage the viewers to go read Federalist well, 66. You're going way back on that one. Okay. Well, way back on this. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what you'll see is he, he, he basically, I mean, he's describing what's happening now. He's describing what happened in the 1990s. Uh, they anticipated that this was going to be a political process, and a lot of it would fall right down partisan lines. And uh, essentially, that's because there is no other way to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the framers considered giving this uh, to the Supreme Court, but felt that as an institution, it wouldn't be able to withstand the kind of political heat that it would have to take in doing something so political. So it's better to leave this to Congress, which is ultimately the the most powerful of the three branches of government, but it's going to be inherently political and, it's, and votes are going to fall down party lines and, and the framers themselves saw that as right. a possibility. At the very least, the Republican leaders and Trump would like to see at least the whistleblower, the initial whistleblower to, yeah. to show his face and, and tell his story. He kind of started the whole thing. And um, I guess if it's, if it's me and I've been accused of something like this, I would like to hear from my accuser. Yeah. Well, is he really the accuser, though, in, no. in, in a tradition? First of all, this isn't a criminal proceeding. The worst that can happen to the president is he's removed from office and barred from holding future office, right? They're, they're, the Constitution forbids any kind of a criminal sanction as a result of this. So the process doesn't necessarily have to be quite the same. And is a whistleblower even accuse, uh, an accuser, or are they simply something bringing to the attention of the appropriate official uh, allegations of wrongdoing. It doesn't have to be something that they themselves witnessed or heard, mm -hmm. uh, but, but simply that they have been made aware of. Sure. And then it's up to, in this case, the inspector general, the appropriate inspector general, to follow up on that and find out, is this true? Is there something to that? A and I do tend to agree um, uh, that uh, the whistleblower right now, their identity is, well, not only would it be problematic to reveal it, but it's really irrelevant. I mean, I think for the president and his supporters, this is a distraction. It's an attempt to draw away from a discussion of the actual facts of right. what, it, what he actually did. It's not necessarily, from a legal slash political standpoint, a bad strategy, but ultimately, what does it matter? If everything the whistleblower said, or most of what the whistleblower said, has been corroborated now by other people who mm -hmm. did listen in on the phone call, who were in Ukraine, you know, involved in the actual meetings that were taking place. I, I don't know that this person's identity is even relevant anymore. Right. Or his attorney that, that kind of set this up in the beginning, which we could go down that path. But I'm going to go in a different direction okay. because I think the issue at this point becomes what he did with that phone call, the quid pro quo. Right. Was it simply improper, something he probably shouldn't be doing, or is it truly high crime and misdemeanors in an impeachable offense. So we have a few polls here okay. that we got today I think are, are worth looking at because when you looked at polls, it's strictly been sort of this down party line. So you look at the first one here, do you think a president of the United States pressuring another country to investigate a political rival is 
you know, it, it says what, 68% I think are... Uh, Republicans uh, are opposed, is that? Uh, yeah, are, are, uh, they believe that's right. You've got 77% mm -hmm. of the Democrats say yes. Yeah. And, uh, no, I got that wrong. 22% of the Republicans say, say yes. 77% of the Democrats say yes, and 52% are independent, which I think is interesting because you've got all the independents are sort of, sort of on the fence there. Right. Going to that second graphic here, do you consider the following to be a high crime uh, or misdemeanor being done dishonest with the American people? 50% of the Republicans say, say yes, 74% Democrats, and then again 56%, a little bit higher in terms of how the independents are thinking. Um, they're on the fence here, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go to the third one. Abusing the powers of office for political advantage, which he's sort of being accused of. So Republicans say 67% say yes, 93% yes, that's party lines, and then the independents again are 75%. And the last one is um, abusing powers of the office for personal enrichment, and there are the numbers there. So d does that right. tell you anything? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, the last two I think yeah. are interesting that they're so high that the Republicans and Democrats are both so universally high. On, on, yeah. on that first one, you know, I think, you know, what you're seeing is a lot of party loyalty there, uh, yeah. and it's the independents that are probably shifting. But on those last two, it is yeah. interesting to see that it does seem to be a crime. So clearly the disagreement would be then whether or not this constitutes dishonesty, whether or not this constitutes using political powers for personal gain. Now, obviously, that is then being seen differently by Republicans and Democrats at, at the moment. Right. Uh, and then the other issue becomes, while the American public and Congress and everybody seems to be so focused on this impeachment inquiry, what's being left out? What are we missing? Not only important legislation, whether that's health care, immig uh, immigration, there are important global events that are sort of taking a back seat that we probably should be paying more attention to. Right? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, you know, this is one of those stories that, that inevitably is going to suck the oxygen out of the room and it's going to dominate, mm -hmm. you know, domestic news, news in the United States. And, and not, not, you know, I mean, to some extent rightly so, but there are things happening right now that, that we, we would normally be headline stories. That, you know, the mm -hmm. leading story right now would probably be the, the, the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. And you don't even hear about this right. anymore. You have to dig. You have to get online. You have to dig to even find out anything about what's happening there. And that's a shame because not only would that be the lead story, but it would be an, an issue where the United States historically would be taking a leading role in supporting those protesters and supporting mm -hmm. American principles and democratic values. Uh, the other big one, I think, is is the Brexit, mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, I'm not even sure how you describe it, the British process of attempting to leave the European Union, sure. of deciding whether or not to right. leave the European Union and, and how they're going to do that. Uh, that's a huge story as well, and that is dominating British politics right now, our closest and strongest mm -hmm. ally, and we're hearing very little about that. And, and interestingly, you kind of come full circle because Britain, you know, uh, Hong Kong, of course, was a former British colony, right. m might ordinarily under these circumstances also be expected to take maybe perhaps a kind of a leadership role on the international stage uh, in um, you know, supporting the protesters and keeping China in check. They're so preoccupied with their own issue right now, leaving sure. the European Union, that they're not focused. So, so in some ways, the, the, the two powers that you would expect to be involved in that Hong Kong situation are so distracted now by their own internal politics mm -hmm. that they're not playing that leadership role internationally. Right, I think that's a very good point because I think middle America is a little bit tired of all this, but uh, despite that point, we're going to go down this path for a little bit while longer at least. Mm -hmm. So one other thing I want to talk to you about before I let you go, mm -hmm. uh, kind of another layer to this, um, is the book Warning mm -hmm. yep. uh, by the anonymous author. Uh, yep making all kinds of disparaging remarks about the president, insiders in the White House, and chaos in the administration. And uh, two things, how do you really trust anything uh, someone says or writes that are not going to be coming forward who they are? It's going to be right. anonymous. And second thing, if indeed it's somebody who was a former White House insider, they mm -hmm. may have some top secret information that they've signed a confidentiality agreement so they could be in trouble with the law. So I'll right. let you go with down that path. Right. Well, not having read the book yet, since yeah. it hasn't been officially released, although I will confess I'm on the waiting list, I've pre-ordered it. Um, uh, I, I have really, I have mixed feelings. I have mixed feelings about the fact that I'm going to be reading it. I, I, um, 
uh, I can't resist, uh, given what I do, given what I teach. Absolutely. I, right. I, I'm sorry. I just I, I, I have to read it. Uh, you know, there's something about somebody remaining anonymous that doesn't sit well with me. Uh, it, it also makes it difficult because we don't, not knowing who this person is, we don't know what position they really mm -hmm. hold. How high up are they? What are they seeing? On the other hand, uh, based on the reports of what the book contains, it does seem to be not just confirming, but I think maybe elaborating upon, giving us sort of coloring in the lines uh, of what we already knew or suspected based on other information that has leaked. Sure. And interestingly enough, uh, Nikki Haley's new book. In all due uh, respect. Yes, right? in all due respect, uh, comes at this from precisely the opposite angle. Basically, uh, she says that she was essentially you know, there was an attempt to recruit her by the Secretary of State uh, uh, and uh, a national security vice to undermine the president. Right. She wouldn't go along with this. So she's taking the president's side in all of this. But what she talks about and what she describes largely syncs up with what we're hearing is in this book by That's the anonymous true. author. Right. So it does seem to be confirming that this is, in fact, happening behind the scenes. It's just how do you interpret this? Right. Which, which, who's right and who's wrong? And, you know, that in and of itself, I think, is... That's, that's a challenging question. I mean, um, if you look at examples from history, there are all sorts of governments where terrible people have come to power. At some point, I think all of us would say, you know, the, the, the true patriot would start to subvert that person to mm -hmm. any extent possible. But then at the same time, any president has people who disagree with them, who think right. absolutely that they are correct and the president is wrong. And does that entitle them automatically then to defy the president to subvert their will? Right. I, I don't think so. So wh where is that line? Right. Have we crossed it? I, I don't right. know. And, and Nikki Haley's assertion in the book, correct me if I'm wrong, I think she said Rex Tillerson and uh, I think John Kelly had said. Let the, yes, yeah, John Kelly. Sorry, I think I said. That's Fulton, right. Come, but, uh, come uh, along yeah. our side, not to simply oppose him face to face, but sort of do it covertly. And that's, she, she didn't want any part of that, so. Right, right. Be, Wh which yeah. again, I mean, it raises all kinds of interesting questions. Yeah. Had, had they gone to the president, and it sounds like people did try to go to the president yeah. right. uh, overtly, and uh, they, they were simply rejected or fired sure. or shut out right. at that point, and that was not working. Doing it covertly, that's, I mean, that's, right. that's a huge thing. I mean, that is, right. I mean, you are now, you know, technically yeah. violating the Constitution, but in an extreme circumstance, Perhaps that's warranted. Again, have we crossed that line? Right. Are we at that point? I don't think we know enough to know right. that yet, and we probably right. won't for some time we'll to see come. See how it plays out, and uh, when you read Warning, I'll have you back. I'd like to get a book review and see what okay. you think. So I'll let you know. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Up next, people in need of welfare assistance don't have to go through as many hoops to get the help they need. So what's changed, and how can you help a family in need this holiday season whose home for now is inside a shelter. Find out next. But first, we'd like to hear from you to help drive the conversation here on the follow-up. Here's how you can do that. Join our conversation by visiting our website at deltabroadcasting.org slash the follow-up. Or hit me up on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Go to facebook.com slash QTV follow-up. And on Twitter at QTV follow-up. And that's not all. Drop us an email at the follow-up at delta.edu, or you can record a comment or question on our follow-up hotline for next week's show. That's 1-877-430-8989. So join the conversation at the follow-up. We really want to hear from you. Welcome back to the follow-up. There is no shortage of people seeking shelter along with the rescue ministries amid Michigan, despite a seemingly robust economy and unemployment levels at near record lows. So what's their story and how can you help? Dan Streeter is the CEO of the Rescue Ministries of Mid Michigan. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for the opportunity. So the Rescue Michigan, uh, Rescue Ministries of Mid Michigan um, is sort of the umbrella organization with some other shelters and missions underneath it. Kind of explain how, how that works. So originally the organization was founded in 1905 and started in downtown Saginaw known as the City Rescue Mission of Saginaw. Over the course of the years now, for 114 years that we've been involved, we've seen tremendous growth in the organization since Dad got involved back in the mid-70s. And uh, now our footprint really is so much more than just Saginaw and Saginaw County. It really is helping this entire region not only with homelessness, but also with poverty-related issues. So we have Community Village, our home for the aged in Saginaw Township. Downtown Saginaw is the City Rescue Mission of Saginaw. 
and then also in Bay County, Good Samaritan Rescue Mission of Bay City. And so that's when we made the name change and officially became Rescue Ministries of Mid-Michigan to help better represent to all those here in this area really the breadth and the depth of help that we provide. You've been at this a long time. I think you told me 27 years, Correct, right? Yeah. And you grew up in this with, with your dad. So tell us about the kinds of people you're sort of seeing at some of these shelters and missions. I think there's a lot of sort of misconceptions how how some of these folks get there. Is it their own fault? What, what are some other issues? And, and what is sort of the profile of some of these folks compared to, I don't know, 20 years ago? Right, so, you know, even uh, the, the face of homelessness has changed so much. Even as a young person, I remember so much how veteran homelessness was just a huge issue. And almost one in three of those back in the 70s that were residing in shelters either had an alcohol problem, mm -hmm. majority single men, and majority were veterans. And now the face of homelessness, it really is your neighbor in need. It's a young mom with a couple kids. It's a younger guy who's been down on his luck. Uh, some of the statistics to see what's going on in the state of Michigan, over 65,000 people were homeless last year. And I don't think people realize really how big of a problem it is within our state. And in our region, you know, really within this listenership, um, about 4,700 people experience homelessness every year uh, just in these surrounding counties and the missions help provide for about 50 percent of that. Mm -hmm. To really get a better feel as well, you know, the general population, about 14 percent of the general population have some type of disability, whether it's physical or um, a mental disability. When you take a look at those that are in emergency shelters, that number goes up to 44% of the population is struggling with either a mental or physical disability. So now it starts to really draw into the mm -hmm. attention the fact that this isn't always just a, a person's choice or a person's bad choices, as a lot of times we think that they deserve to be homeless. Mm -hmm. it, when, when people come in there, and, and there are different circumstances, and they're there for different periods of time. So some are going in there, a single mom with kids for a day to get a meal. Others may need a lot more time, be there a week. Um, so no matter what time they spend in there, is there, is there sort of an uh, expectation on both sides what they're supposed to do and what, what they're accountable for, right? Right. Yeah. So first of all, to think about what it is like to be homeless, the majority of people, the last thing they do is to come to the shelter. The first thing that they've tried to do is to get a place of their own or to stay with a friend or with a family member. So. Uh, the majority of times what they've already experienced is for several months they've bounced around in uncertainty mm -hmm. in difficult situations and all they've heard is no and rejection and so as soon as they come through the door we want to restore hope we want to let them know that this community cares and so it starts with that first positive interaction but then you also build on that with meaningful solutions and trying to have meaningful programs so we have different tracks depending on how a person presents and what may be the situations that they're coming mm -hmm. to us. We have a veterans track, a mental health track, uh, a, a, uh, a disability track, or some it's just about uh, vocational. I need to get vocationally reestablished. Sure. And so there's a blending then of specialization, life skill classes, rebuilding that person, restoring the hope to try to then get them back on their own feet so they won't have to ever repeat homelessness again. All right, so it's not one size fits all and uh, take it or leave it. We've got a track for you that can specialize and get you back on your feet. Yes. So big news sort of here in the last month, Governor Whitmer signed a pretty significant bill that affects the work that you do and, and the people that, that you take in to make it somewhat easier, um, I think, for those seeking assistance not to go through as many hoops, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? So I, I think once again, a lot of times we have misperceptions and and I know in previous administrations some of the rules were put in there because there had been abuse in the, in the system of those that were receiving public support. So there was a big outcry for more accountability. And I think then the pendulum swung too far in that direction. So I think it's been a good step to make sure that there's a more standardized approach and uh, you know every department or every potential thing that you were asking for through the Department of Health and Human Services had different levels. So now this standardizes the level it says it's okay to have a savings account and you can still get public assistance. We teach our people that are coming through the doors, you just got a job, well you need to have a budget and any smart budget is going to have an emergency fund in it. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to save for 
if something you need a car repair or something that happens. So this allows for people to be able to have some of these things that they're going to need in normal daily living, but at the same time not have to burn that emergency fund in order to just be able to get uh, some food. Yeah, I think what the governor had said when, when she sort of signed this bill, she said a lot of these folks that you're seeing are just sort of one lost paycheck away from knocking on your door and being on the street, right? I mean, and, and that's the yeah. other thing. We have yeah. so many people. We see new faces coming through the mission all the time. And so uh, we range between 45 to 55 percent of those who come to the mission never have to come back for a second stay. So mm -hmm. we have a very low recidivism number. And, and so those are new faces that are coming all the time because we have so many people and so many families that are living right on the edge of poverty. And so one or two things go a little awry and then everything crumbles. And so this is really helping Department of Health and Human Services to continue to be that safety net, help fill those gaps, and hopefully we won't see as many people that are having to do shelter stays. I know you're working a lot of new initiatives, the Vision 2020 uh, plan. Talk to us about that. I think you've got one part of that that's called what, impact design, right? Correct. So one of the things that we've become really compelled about is as we see where people are at with poverty and trying to help get them out of poverty and not have to continue to live in it, um, one of the things we saw really practical, when people move out of shelter, what reality is, is a lot of times they're moving into an apartment that doesn't have a bed for their kids, mm -hmm. and so the kids are sleeping on the floor. They don't have dishes uh, for their household. They don't have a microwave. And so you think, here you've done all this work to get back on your feet. you got your own place, and the first night you stay there is really more depressing than it is about rewarding. Sure. And so it really kind of undermines whether or not this is really my home. So what we want to do instead is we're going to build a 5,000 square foot warehouse right there on the site of the mission and uh, then be able to help engage every family that moves out of shelter into permanent housing with that home makeover type of experience and, and blending our staff and volunteers and, and taking donated furniture and then creating it into a really special type of an event. And then there's going to be follow-up case management in the house visits that goes along. So we're really excited. Um, we're really close to having finished the fundraising piece of that, okay. and we're expecting this spring to start breaking ground, and hopefully by the summer of 2020, the full program will be launched. And we're going to talk more about, about that in a moment before you get off about how people can uh, respond, respond to your need. A youth shelter for kids ages 13 or 12 to 17 in Bay City. Tell us about that. So there had been an organization in place that closed in 2015 that had been providing care for young people for age 12 to 17. And so there has been a huge gap in Bay County ever since. Uh, and so we, have, we were not able to be able to step up to that need immediately when that organization closed. But now we have been working with the state of Michigan to get licensed and right there on the site of Good Samaritan Rescue Mission to open up a 10-bed facility for youth. Uh, we're at about 85% of the funds raised, renovations that are happening right now to the space, and we believe somewhere right near the beginning of February, we should have all the licensing finished, all the renovations finished, and be able to start helping to provide service for teens aged 12 to 17. There's so many young people that are just bouncing around from one difficult uh, point to another, that they're being preyed upon. Mm -hmm. um, one out of 15 have parents who, ha either one or both parents have been incarcerated. 30% of these young people are experiencing some type of physical or emotional abuse. We need to get them out of those unhealthy situations and help get them into a better, better stable So I was going to ask more about that. They, they could be runaways. They could be in a human trafficking situation. Uh, somehow they're just left in the street because they're caretakers elsewhere. I mean. Who, who are these kids? I mean, there's so, so there's yeah. a, you know, it could also be a foster care situation that maybe yeah. isn't going healthy. Right. It, it could be a healthy family relationship and mom or dad has put in new rules and the, and the kid runs sure. away. So the, everything from good environment to bad environment. And so we're going to be that safety net, just like we have been for adults and families. We're going to be that safety net for kids who are at risk. So then that way they don't fall prey Right. to all of the things that are out there just waiting to snatch them in Got and it. take advantage of them. So it's a temporary situation for these young people while you find maybe a new track for them and find them some more permanent housing with a permanent Correct. family. Yep. So I know we're getting into the holiday season. That's one of the reasons I, I brought you on. I know you have a need all year long, but getting into Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, 
you have a great need. So what is the current need right now? What would you like people to do? And I'd like us to throw up that, that website for people to take a look at um, because I think that's important, the R3 m online.org at rescue ministries of mid michigan so tell us about the current need as you're going to the, the holiday season so there go go uh, first hands there and you can see we have a needs list on there that you can make a donation and there's also an opportunity to volunteer and you can see examples of some ways that you can volunteer basically the biggest thing i'd say is get engaged do something think about your neighbor in need it truly is the person that could be down the street that's that's struggling and when you're helping, you're helping local people, you're helping our local economy, you're helping to, to help rebuild the network that we have within our community. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many different ways, whether it's, it's donating a, a, a canned food items to, that we're gonna serve for people who are staying there that night, or whether it's the new, new clothing, uh, new socks, new underwear, um, all of those types of things. The biggest thing is if you know nothing about the mission, come and see firsthand where a local charity all the dollars stay right here, impacting local lives. We are rated a four-star charity with Charity Navigator. You can see a link on our website. We're accountable, we're transparent, and we're right here helping people. Right. Speaking of volunteering, you said there's a litany uh, on the list on that website, but can I go serve food? Can I, can I be a mentor? Can I, can I work on a project? Uh, what, what are some of the big things? You can things paint a wall, all of the above, paint right. a wall. You can help with the move in when we do impact designs. There is really so many things, and, and you can even just be a shadow with our staff in the evenings. There's so many things, tutoring, help teach classes. Um, the best thing is to come in, talk one-on-one, -on -one, take a short tour, talk one-on-one -on -one with one of our volunteer coordinators, mm -hmm. and they would love to engage and hear what your interests are, what some of your strengths are, and what compels you. What, what, what would you like to do to help people? Well, you're doing a lot of great work, and uh, think of the folks that you serve, our viewers. Uh, keep them in mind that this holiday season. Uh, uh, they need a lot of help, and they're right in your backyard. So, Dan Streeta, thanks for coming in, and uh, good luck this holiday season with the work that you're doing. And that's our show for tonight, but be sure to join us again next week for the follow-up. In the meantime, hit us up on social media or dial into our follow-up hotline to help drive the conversation here on the show. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next week. Have a great night.